<laughs> What's up? No, no, no. Anytime between now and the, when we meet. So, uh, no, nothing to do for you guys until we get to that meeting. Right, right, right. Or no, it doesn't matter which one we're doing, but so we're not making any difference. All right. <laughs> drawing for the trip to Hawaii. Oh. Are you ready? <laughs> Testing one, two, three. Okay, fabulous. Now we got everything working. Nobody's brains are fried too badly today. These tech conferences can be a little bit overwhelming. And so I just wanted to remind everybody a couple of other things that um, Ruth was alluding to. But remember that there is going to be, uh, it already is, a Google site with all of these materials and links and things like that. So if you're, something happens to your precious font bon bag, you leave it on the bus, or you lose your handouts, or what have you, they're all going to be available. I know several of the sessions did have Google Docs that you can contribute to in the long run. So please make sure that you check into sessions that you didn't get to go to. It's tough sometimes. There are some sessions that it's very easy. You know exactly what you want to go to. But there are other ones where it's very difficult. And so if you missed one, you can at the very least get in touch with the person who did it. You can usually see the materials. You can get a good idea of what was going on. And then use that just to kind of build your knowledge in that area. So to wrap up today, I just wanted to talk very briefly um, about some of the things that we can expect to see in the long run. I've been talking today about those four concepts, the motivation, collaboration, time, and resources that all can really contribute to our students' understanding and how technology can shape and frame all of those ideas. And we've been dealing with technology of the past and things that are going on right now, and now we need to look ahead and that's something that is very difficult to do because people want to guarantee, usually. They want to know what is going to happen. Nobody knows that. We can take some guesses, some educated guesses, based on what is coming, based on what we've seen, but we never really ultimately know what's going to happen. So we're going to explore just a couple of the different possibilities. And I want you to think about these in terms of your own school, the resources that they have available, the attitudes that you may be encountering, because that's a huge thing. You run into people who are very supportive of what you want to do, and there will be people who are violently opposed to it. 
That is part of the deal. If you're going to be involved in technology, you better expect those people who are not happy about what you're doing because they have other issues that they are dealing with too. So it's important to always think about, about all of these things. So when we think about this future, we can break this down into basically three components. School, your classmates, and your lessons. So I'm going to save you the suspense right now. It's all changing. Okay, all of it. All of it, just whatever you have kind of built up in your head right now, whether it changes tomorrow or next week or next year or five or ten years from now, these changes are not backtracking. They are moving forward. There's, I, there's very little that I would say with absolute certainty, but that's one of them. So that's it. We're done. You want to go home? It's all changing. Okay. All right. So the, there are lots of ways that I could go on for days about how these things are changing. But I want you to remember, for those of you who are kind of Twitter addicts like myself, you see these things running across your feed every day. And you get notices on new technologies and new strategies and new things that are being shared in this conversation. And these things come out before we can even come up with a name for a conference, much less share those tools with you. So getting connected, whether that means through Twitter, through Facebook, through Edmodo, through you know, any kind of resource that you have, be a part of that conversation because these changes are going to be, mean something very, very significant for you and for your students. So I can find one example that kind of will illuminate what I'm talking about here. And that's probably MOOCs. Have you ever heard of a MOOC? Have you heard of it? Okay. So this is something that I think a lot of people in higher ed uh, know about a little bit more. It's not quite um, to the K-12 yet, but in considering your professional development, I do want to make sure you know what it is. It's called a Massively Open Online Course. And this was done periodically by Harvard, MIT, Stanford. They wanted to start opening up their, co their courseware. Because what they were finding was that people around the world, not just here, but they thought that education should be available. That's a pretty basic concept for us. You know, we provide public education. They also felt, though, that higher education was going to be very important. And they felt like everybody should have that opportunity, which is a really fantastic idea. And so what they did was they started these MOOCs. And this one is actually taken from Course, uh, Coursera. And that's an organization that brings in, I think there are about 16 universities that are all a part of this organization now. And I took a class with them, actually, that just finished. Um, well, it'll finish tomorrow, actually. But it's a course on gamification. And so if you, you know, attended Orlando's session this morning, you talked a little bit about gaming. But the concept of gamification ties into, it was largely a business class, but it tied into education, it tied into um, gaming, design, technology, it, it tapped into all of these different areas. And I signed up for it because number one, it's free. And very, very seldom will I turn down free education. Okay? It's always a good thing. But the other important thing is the um, instructor, Kevin Warbeck, is a well-known business and gaming um, professor out at, I think it's Penn State, is where he's at. But when I took this course, I wanted to get a real good idea of what this actually meant. And when I signed in, it had a series of videos, quizzes, assignment, peer graded assignments, discussions, and there were 85,000 participants in this class. 85,000 in here, and it was one of the smaller ones. <laughs> Some of the other ones were much, much bigger than that. The participants in this class were from, I want to see, he said he thought it was about 109 countries around the world. I could participate in discussions at any time, day or night, and somebody else was logged in. And I could also discuss a lot of these issues with them. You should have seen the discussions that we were having. It wasn't just me talking about what I think from my corner of the world in St. Louis in education. You know, it was also people who were working in business in Bangalore and tried to figure out a way to make their you know, very early startup business work. And you wouldn't think that people in all these corners of the world have anything in common. We all had everything in common. It was really, really surprising. It was one of the most incredible, incredible experiences. And so the whole notion of school really changed in my mind because it's not just this you know, one university. It's not your one K-12 environment. It's not just these professional development opportunities. The, our definition of what school is can change pretty drastically. Clearly who our classmates are can change very, very drastically. Uh, one of the students who was in this class, I don't know if he was technically supposed to be enrolled or not, but I know he was 10 
he posted this picture, and I thought, wow, I'm, I, seriously, I'm 37, and I cannot believe I'm going to school with a 10 year old. He was great. He was great. He was bright. He was insightful. He had a lot of things to say, and he brought a really unique, fresh perspective. So the idea of who your classmates can be, that was a real eye-opener, too. These lessons were videos, quizzes, interactive assignments. Whether or not we use those things a lot in our classrooms is something that can be possible. And so this, these ideas are, can be translated in K-12 in a very, very different way. And so I got a couple of images here because, first of all, that crowd that seriously 85,000 people is no joke. They had lots and lots of people from lots of corners of the world here. Um, one of the ways that this might translate into a K-12 classroom, in my session we talked a little bit about hybrid learning, and you would think that that's something that's really kind of isolated to higher ed. It's not. One of the schools I read about on my feed just last week is in Colorado, and they sectioned off part of their cafeteria because they decided to move into a more hybrid format, and they turned it into an internet cafe. And it's immensely popular, immensely popular. The students absolutely love it. They're learning a lot from it, um, so they can really make it work. So what your school might look like could change pretty drastically, too. I did have a section here on my Facebook from a while back, and unfortunately, the picture didn't really turn out very well. But I have a friend in uh, Tel Aviv, and he was here for quite a while, and then he decided to move back. And the nice thing about him is he has lived in probably six or seven countries. He knows people in many, many more. And so when he moved back, quite often when I check on his Facebook page, there's Hebrew in there. Well, I don't know anything about Hebrew. I barely speak enough high school French to get myself into trouble. That was about it. So when I saw these, I said, you know what, this is ridiculous. So there's a conversation going on, and I'm not a part of it. And I hate that. I always hate being left out of a good conversation. And they all appeared very excited. So I pulled out Google Translate. I copied and pasted right into there to see what were they saying. And they were congratulating him on this race that he ran, which was phenomenal because he would never run when he was here. He really got into running when he went there. And so I responded, and in Hebrew, I just translated it and everything, and he was so impressed, wrote everything all cast, I cannot believe you did that, wow, that's amazing. And I said, well, yeah, it's Google Translate, it's not really amazing. So this one simple conversation turned into, and then by the time it was done, it was about 150 strands, comments, because people started commenting in every language they could find. It was Hebrew, it was French, it was German, it was Russian, it was just Arabic, you name it. We all had part of it. And it was funny because a good 10 people on there then became my friends after a while. I don't friend people on Facebook unless I know you, but these people were really, really funny. And I learned a lot from them, and I actually had one of them serve as a guest speaker in a class a year later. So who your classmates are. Your classmates aren't just people who are sitting in a room with you and they all pay tuition and they're all going to sit there and learn the same things in the same way. It's not, it's not the game anymore. Now a lot of these things seem like very, very new ideas, but actually they tap into something that's rather old and that's the explanation of the difference between education and schooling. Whoops. And I, this is always, I, I have a ton of Mark Twain quotes that I absolutely love, but this one's always been my favorite. So I've never let schooling get in the way of my education. And what we think of as education, and for us and for our students, is really um, can be pretty, pretty radically different. So one of the most important things, how do we then determine, of all the technologies that we saw here, some of them are really cool. They're really fun, they're really exciting. But are they gonna work? Just because somebody else is excited, enthusiastic about it, doesn't mean it's the right choice for you. It doesn't mean that it's a good te technology or a bad technology. Too often we do that. We say, oh, that's, that's really good, or no, that's really bad. No, this technology is really good for me in this class, in this situation. And it may not be that way for you. So having to make up your own mind about that is really, really important. So how do we do that? Because the number of resources that are available are staggering and we really don't even know where to begin a lot of times. So what we do is we follow the cardinal rule of teaching. My mentor always told me, start with the student. You start with the student that's sitting right in front of you. What does that student need in order to be successful in your class? If you can answer that question, then you know that you at least have a starting point and you know how to assess this technology effectively. And you always wanna know what is my problem exactly? What is the issue that I'm facing? And then how can I use that to ask some really important questions about the technology? And that's what we don't do enough of. 
as teachers. We don't ask those questions. We just get excited about it. We start employing it. Maybe it succeeds, maybe it doesn't. But if it fails, everyone around you points to it and says that didn't work, we're not gonna do it, and they give up on it. And so if we learn to ask these questions ahead of time, if we start assessing it a little bit better, then we're gonna get really, really good at knowing what is good and what is not. Now, most teachers do look at cost. <laughs> that is one thing that they look at. Is it free, is it not free? You know, that's, that's a very important question to ask. So that's why it's kind of highlighted and right in the center there. Um, some other things that we don't really think about, though, are copyright. Sometimes we think about copyright, and it maybe keeps us awake at night, thinking we're gonna get sued or something like that. Um, but copyright is, is, an, is an issue for some people, but probably not as many as it should be. Um, the required training. That's something that a lot of people don't think about. Remember we talked about the time that it takes to do that grade challenge? There are lots of things. I want you to go back to your classrooms and think real carefully about what are the things you're doing throughout your day that are sucking up time that don't really need to. And one of the things when you're looking at a technology is how hard is it to use? If it's really hard and it requires a lot of training, you better translate that into what you get paid each hour because that's lost time and that's lost money. That is, doesn't mean it's not worth it. Sometimes it's absolutely worth it, but you want to think about that before you look into it. Um, the accessibility issue, that's, that's huge. That's really, really important for your schools right now. If you can ask yourself questions about whether or not, or ask the vendor, is this technology accessible and make them give you a straight answer, because they won't. <laughs> they won't. They will sidestep it if they possibly can. So ask them directly, are you 508 compliant? If they answer yes, fantastic. If they answer no or they give you the runaround, you're gonna to wanna to let your IT department know that because that is a big issue for your administrations right now. They're gonna to wanna to know. Uh, the adoption issue. How many times have you seen your school buy an incredible, amazing, very cool technology and it doesn't get used by more than about five people who are on the committee in the first place? We see this all the time, all the time, because it's really, really cool, but how do you get everybody else on board? It doesn't mean you don't try. But is there a way for you to get people to adopt the technology? Is there something built into your school system, your culture, that will encourage people to use it once you have decided to adopt it? These are all questions that your administration are going to ask too, but you're going to want to be partners in this because another thing, one of the changes that's coming down the road is the line between admins and teachers may not be quite so clear after a while. There needs to be a collaborative effort. And a lot of schools that are very successful know that. Well, the last thing that I would probably want to point out, because we tend to get very excited about open source tools, anything that's free and cool and fun and new, is the long range prospects. We don't really think about this, but it's very important to know that if you're going to invest time, resources, if you're going to build a curriculum around a particular tool, is it going to be there in a year? Is it going to be there in two years? I think we keep thinking that they're always going to be, <laughs> and they're not. They're not always. This is a constantly, constantly shifting environment. And it's a tough question to answer. It's a very tough question. But it's one that, that's at least worth asking. So these are all things we want to be thinking about. We've been talking a lot, though, about the future of the classroom and the environment and everything. But one of the things that I always see lacking in talks and in sessions is talking about you guys. So what is actually happening to your jobs? as teachers, as paras, as um, administrators, some of you. So how is your job going to look? What is, what is, how is it going to change over the next several years? All I can do is offer you some of the things that I know I've been hearing about and reading about. So what I'd like you to think about is where you are going to be maybe three, four years before retirement. Now, for some of you, that's close or <laughs> closer. For some of you, it's a really, really distant thing in the future, and it's very, very hard to imagine. But I do want you to think about, I don't, I don't ever really honestly think about retirement. I didn't think about it for a while, especially for, for teachers, because we tend to think that we probably won't ever really retire. I mean, you're always going to teach class or be involved in school or something. And if this, if you kind of come up with an image in your mind of what this is going to look like, by the time you get to that point. If this is what you're seeing in your mind, you, you're gonna wanna catch up. <laughs> this is not gonna be anything. It's not gonna be anything like that. Even those of you who are just a few years out, you'll be surprised at how quickly things are changing here. 
there are a couple of different ways that this could change. Number one is a job change. And I come from a family of teachers, and uh, sadly half of them are in Wisconsin, so you can imagine how much fun they've had over the last two years. <laughs> and uh, I, I was really surprised when a couple of them came to me, my cousins, and said, you know, we know that you research this stuff a lot and everything. What is there for us to do other than classroom teaching? And it's a question that they never themselves ever imagined asking me. And knowing their environment and knowing how hostile it is over there, uh, I saw that one coming. <laughs> I kind of knew that that was coming. So is it, could you even imagine yourself in a job change? And that's something that most classroom teachers know. They say, no, I can't really imagine that. Because this is kind of what we're used to seeing. Hey, this is our job, to be a classroom teacher, and we have all these different responsibilities. Way too many, honestly, <laughs> for one person. But what we do end up seeing here is you have to obviously create your content, you know, present your content, assess and report your learning, grading, advising students. And there, for many of us, there are many, many other things that are attached to this. But these are kind of the basic components that we all share. What some schools are doing, and I'm going to divert a little bit here because I do want to show you what, we, what this could be like and what some schools are actually looking at doing now because it's not something most people think about. The traditional classroom teacher in some schools, uh, that role is changing quite a bit. They're actually experimenting with breaking down this role into different types of faculty. There could be content faculty, grading faculty, rigor faculty, and relationship faculty. How many of you are maybe very, very comfortable with creating your content, but you hate the grading? <laughs> you hate the grading. Yeah, I'm, a lot of stuff. I'm with you. I hate the grading. There are times, though, when I would give up having to deal with the content or the rigor, I mean, the assessment component of it and the relationship. Back. Like if all I could do was just grade interesting assignments, if they were just projects, I didn't have anything else to do, that, that could be fun for a while. Um, there are a lot of people who are really, really good at talking to students and their parents and their counselors and encouraging them and kind of being a cheerleader for their development. They love doing that part. They could take away the content. So is it possible then, and I don't have an answer again, but is it possible then for us to take this create the content section and we're going to move that over here and assessing and reporting. Let me try to get a mouse going here. Okay. Go ahead and move that over to the regular faculty job. And grading, obviously goes under grading. <coughs> advising students that can go to the relationship guru and then presenting you can probably just put that over into content as well so this is a bit of a different design than we're used to seeing you're not usually used to seeing that job broken down very much but there are some schools that are demo they're um, experimenting with hybrid and blended and, and online formats but now what they're finding some of them is that breaking down this job into different components makes it easier to manage now, am I telling you that you can end up in your career only grading? No, of course not. I would never wish that on anybody. So, but what the, the time that this first came about for me is when I uh, moved from Atlanta to St. Louis and I uh, started working for the Georgia Virtual Program, which is an online program for Midland High School students. And all my students were baseball players who had to travel constantly and couldn't get into class. I had always at least one homebound student who was terminally ill every semester and what am I going to do? Tell that kid, oh, I'm sorry, you can't go to school so you can't learn? Of course not. Nobody's going to say that. So what we did was we decided to start breaking this down a little bit and what I found really interesting is that I really got very close to my students. I didn't think of myself as a relationship faculty kind of person, but in this development I really did. I really did enjoy that. There were also times, though, um, that after I had decided to go back to school and finish my doctorate, that I didn't have time for that anymore. I really couldn't take the phone calls at 9 o'clock at night from a parent who was worried about their kid. I needed to control my time a lot better because there were other things I had to worry about. And so I moved into being a content faculty. At that point, I didn't have to worry about catching up with other students. All I had to worry about was getting the content going. And that access to a different part of the brain. That was a lot of fun too, because I learned a lot more about my subject than I did before. Am I telling you this is how it's gonna go? No, not necessarily. But I will tell you that there are a lot of schools that are looking at this. So is it possible then 
to take this sort of idea and figure out, is, did, would this make sense for you? Or sense for your students? Because one of the things that we're learning out of the digital age is that everything can be customizable. Everything can make sense. There is no, this is a general way that it's going, but every district, every school is doing things just a little bit different. And so even just exposing yourself to what they're doing is valuable, at least it's good to know that this is happening. Okay. Over here. Okay. The other thing that I think a lot of teachers are just very allergic to is business, <laughs> for good reason. We all tend to think of it that way. We like to put school in one area and business in another area. What, I, what is important to tell you here is companies like Blackboard obviously is a very large course management system. They're huge. Um, when I spoke to their sales rep a few weeks ago, he told me that about one third of their employees are former teachers. So they're all people who have been in the classroom, who work there, because Blackboard can't function if they don't understand schooling. They tried. They tried to do it without teachers and it wasn't working at all and they almost folded. So they decided to start getting in more people and so that was very important and they started working on that development a lot more. The textbook companies all obviously have to employ content specialists and teaching specialists to get all of those great activities going. The other important component here is education startups. So last year we invested 1.7 billion dollars in education startups. So a lot of these new tools and strategies and things that you saw in the exhibit hall and some of the presentations, somebody who was techie had a very exciting idea and wanted to tap into it. They thought that they can contribute something to education and so they decided to start a startup. And what's amazing though is since 2009, the number of startups that have gotten funding has gone up 300% every year and it's going up again in 2012. All of these people are going to need your help. They're going to ask for it. Are they going to pay you really well? Are they going to give you a flexible schedule? Are there things that they can give you that the schools can't give you? Maybe, maybe not. But these are all possibilities too. They're all things to think about kind of in the long run. Another important thing to think about is location change. And we don't like to talk about this in St. Louis because we don't go anywhere for the most part, you know. I, people find out I left after graduation to Atlanta, and I'm like, why? <laughs> I had no idea why I left anywhere. Um, but I did want to point out just one case uh, that I read about a while back, and that was something called the phenomenon known as Portugal's brain drain. You guys know how bad the situation is over there. A um, lot of new grads are just not finding jobs. The unemployment rate is staggering. And something they were finding very unusual was happening in Portugal in particular. The unemployment rate among young people was somewhere around 60, 65%. It was really, 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 really bad. <laughs> and these are not just you know new grads with a bachelor's in philosophy. These are people with doctorates and JDs. They were advanced, advanced degrees. Bright people, smart people. These are not the people you want to lose, but they're losing them. They're losing them because there are no jobs. There's just no job. They've been looking everywhere. They've been looking all over Europe. They've been looking in England. They've been, well, England is Europe, but they've been looking all over the place and they just couldn't find it. And one of the things they were finding them doing was they were going to former colonies in Portugal, Angola, Brazil. These were all areas that are growing drastically. They cannot keep up. Brazil is begging for engineers. If anybody knows an engineer who needs a job, okay. The uh, World Cup and the Olympics have really put a, de a very, very high demand. The city's uh, Rio de Janeiro is growing drastically. The mayor is going around begging for people. And for these students in Portugal who cannot get a job to save their lives, or they're getting one, and they're getting paid minimum wage as civil engineers, it, it's, they, some of them have gotten to the point where they decided it's time to make a change. Now, quite often people make a change like that, and it's very, very drastic. But they decided to go back to former colonies because they speak the same language. So usually, one of the, a couple of the big barriers to us moving and finding different kinds of work are, do we even speak the language? That's very, very important. And how hard is it to get back? It's one thing if you decide to take a job in Chicago, because you can drive back and you can fly back, but if you go to Mozambique, well, it's going to take you, it's going to be very, very expensive to fly back. And it's going to be very, a very, very long, difficult trip. Now, what about 30 years from now? That's pretty much when I plan to retire. So in 30 years, 
Is it going to be possible for me to go find a really cool job in a developing country that really, really needs my help, needs my expertise because they're growing, and I could find a really cool environment, and maybe I could fly home in three hours instead of 16? I don't know. It's possible. These are all the countries around the world that currently have English as their official language. And we don't really think about this <laughs> all that much. But see, there are a considerable number of countries in Africa and India and right around here that areas that right now we wouldn't really consider. And one of the ones that kind of stuck out to me was Liberia. It's right here along the coast. And uh, without getting into too much detail, they have formed their government almost directly on ours. Small country, gorgeous, uh, beautiful area, really, really struggling economy right now. Probably not the kind of place I would want to just pick up and, and go help at the moment. But for these areas where they're working on their infrastructure now, what's the place going to be like in 20 or 30 years? Would it be possible for me to go there? It's beautiful. It's a really, really gorgeous place. There could be really important, meaningful work there down the road. So these are all just kind of things to think about. Now, I know a lot of this seems very far-fetched. <laughs> it's usually the reaction I get is, oh, come on. We're not ever going to move to Angola. We're not going to move over here. We're not going to be able to fly back in three hours. Maybe we can. Maybe we can. But if we look back at some of the different things that people were concerned about throughout history, it kind of puts it in perspective. So this one says, these are quotes from various publications throughout history. Students today depend on paper too much. They don't know how to write on a slate without getting chalk dust all over themselves. What will they do when they run out of paper? This was a principal's publication in 1815. It was a very legitimate concern for our students. Ballpoint pens will be the ruin of education in our country. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> students use these devices and then throw them away. The American values of thrift and frugality are being discarded. Businesses and banks will never allow such expensive luxuries. <laughs> Federal teachers in 1950. These were legitimate concerns back then. We laugh at it now, but these were legitimate concerns back then. The next one, though, I think is still my favorite. Computers give students an unfair advantage. Therefore, students who use computers to analyze data or create displays will be eliminated from the science fair, which is from a science fair judge, Apple Classroom of Tomorrow. <laughs> Chronicles in 1988. I remember 1988. Now, that, that one kind of surprises me. And so this is, if you ever want to read about this stuff, there's a fantastic book, and I'll, I'll put it on the Google site, but it, it's Rethinking Education in the Age of Technology, and it, it taps into these ideas and many, many, many more of different points in history where we were very, very skeptical of new technology. So it's important to remember that we've been here before. This isn't new. We've always been very skeptical of moving forward, and for very good reason. So to give you an idea of where we're at now, these are some of these things you've probably seen or heard of before. So I've talked to some of you if you're a TED addict. I know you've seen it because they have them all over the place. But these are some of the developments that have come across in the last couple of years that are getting closer to market than you think. So this one is the Google car. Anybody ever heard of the Google car before? And yeah, Google decided to create its own car because it didn't have enough to do. They decided we're going to move into this area. And it's actually a self-driving car and they developed it in San Francisco and attempted to drive it up and down all these streets. And they were very successful at it. And so they decided that they were gonna go ahead and market it, but they had to get a driver's license for it because it's the robot that needs the driver's license. So where do you go if you wanna get something passed quickly and easily? You got it, Nevada. All right, where else are you going to go to get something legal very fast? So that's where they had to go. And now, technically, in Nevada, these are legal. There's another 12 states that are investigating it right now. It's going through some of their legal channels. So this isn't all that far off. There is a video on YouTube that I, I should probably post that as a link to, but they, they actually have a blind man driving up to a Taco Bell and ordering, and that's one of the funniest things I've seen. So he was very excited. He never thought he'd be able to drive. Uh, some of the other things here, the Terracuja, which is a this little sort of funky winged looking thing, that's actually a car that flies. And that they've been testing that at MIT, it's been very successful, they've used it um, across the board. It's very expensive right now, but who knows where it'll be in a while. So basically what happens is it's about the size of an SUV, and the wings just fold up, and you can drive it on the road. 
And so the woman who was demonstrating this said part of the problem with people who want to fly a lot is that they can't really, they, they either have to drive out to the airport and then they have to get in their plane and then they have to worry about weather. This takes care of all of that. If there's bad weather, that's not a problem. Find the nearest road, land on it, put your wings up and drive the rest of the way. You're fine. <laughs> to me, that was a bizarre notion. But people are coming up with these sorts of things all the time. And they're coming up with it because they're collaborating on these ideas. They're not isolated anymore. So that's why they're coming up with these things. The final one is the, um, the Sixth Sense technology. And it's kind of hard to see from this picture, but basically he's got little, I don't know, some sort of covers for his fingers. And it serves as a, um, a computer screen. So he's got a camera attached to sort of where his necklace around him. And it can project an image from your computer in front of you. You can use these devices on the ends of your fingertips to scroll through pages. You can get additional information off of a print newspaper. You can take pictures with it. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty bizarre technology, but this sort of thing has gotten a lot of press as well. This is where we're at now. I mean, this isn't, this isn't something far off or something that people are thinking about. These things are here. They're already here right now. They can actually grow livers and petri dishes at this point. They haven't been able to figure out how to do it with the kidney yet, but the medical advancements have really, really been taking off. It may not be too long before transplants are a thing of the past. So this is the sort of thing that's really changing, not just education, it's changing how we think about our society and our culture. And that does ultimately impact our education because that's what this is all about. So to finish up today, I wanted to conclude because quotes are just my favorite thing. And this has to be one of my favorites of all time. Thomas Friedman is a New York Times columnist. You probably heard of his uh, book, The World's Flat. It's probably the one that, that everybody's heard of. But he talks about these ideas in terms of big breakthroughs. And so the big breakthroughs happen when what is suddenly possible meets what is desperately necessary. So when you go back to your schools, I want you to think about what is desperately necessary. And now after you have visited with everybody today, what is suddenly possible? Okay. All right, you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thank you very much for attending.